Welcome to the Vine Resources Podcast Show with your host, David Lawrence. There we go. Melanie, thanks for joining me. Nice to be here. It's going to be an interesting conversation. I think you've got a whole load of questions for me. So I'm going to let you sort of start the ball rolling um, and then I shall probably take over completely. Fantastic. And what I'm going to do, Melanie, I'm just going to put a group chat out to, to everyone here while we're waiting because there's a, make sure that the, the, the technology is working. But Melanie, before we start, I'd love just to share with our, our listeners and those who are just about to join. Can you share with us a little bit about your background and who you are? And uh, yeah, I'd be really grateful for that, if that's okay. That's fine. I started life over 30 years ago as a business analyst. Uh, then I became a project manager and I really, really enjoy project management, but it was in the days of waterfall project management. Um, so there was, uh, this was before Prince 2 became the standard um, mm. and we were sort of working on projects. I took on more, more uh, projects. I became a sort of program manager, uh, stroke portfolio manager, um, and I carried on and became global head of project and program management for several of the investment banks. Uh, I then became CEO of a training consultancy company. Um, and then about uh, nearly 10 years ago now, I became freelance um, and I work for interesting organizations overseeing um, their large scale transformations. So it's strategy work, but it's also mm -hmm. capability building, um, which is where probably this conversation will take us because I'm really interested in building up the skills of people to make a difference in their organizations. That means bringing together the project management world and the change management world to realize benefits. So if we don't come together, <laughs> we won't get any benefits um, because at the end of the day, it's not just the tangible changes that the projects deliver, um, but it's also the behavioral changes, um, the creating, if you like, of a, a, a new way of working. And when that becomes the, ha the new habit, then we realize the benefits because it's only when you start working in the new way that the company can say, hey, we're more efficient, we've streamlined, or we've, we've got a new service that's actually working for our customers. So that's my really my enthusiasm. And I do this for fun. I absolutely love what I do. Now, but now, before we started this, and I can see a few people are, are still joining as we we just passed the stream over to my 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 LinkedIn profile as opposed to the company profile. So that's just taken a few minutes for people to come online. If you're watching this now, um, just yeah, jump over to my profile on LinkedIn, and you'll be able to get the live feed. Um, how are you been coping with lockdown? I mean, you know, we we talked about it just before we started, and there's obviously a lot of people that are not perhaps as you know outgoing as yourself or I that you know might have been struggling a little bit with it but how's it going for you and what, what advice would you give for people who are pushing through? Um, I think uh, I'm in Spain um, I arrived here a day before the official lockdown began to look after my elderly father um, and it was really scary in the first few weeks because the rules here have been in incredibly harsh um, but we all adapted to them uh, 200 meters outside of your own home only go out if you were going for your weekly shop or to put the garbage out um, and basically we had week after week of that um, what saved me um, I was really lucky because I arrived on the Saturday and I started work on the Sunday uh, with one of my groups in the Middle East and so there was no time to sort of think oh, this is different and I've worked six days a week 10 12 14 hours a day um, yep. each of those six days so I have Saturdays off uh, come what may and the structure it's the structure of my work um, that has given not just me but also my elderly father some structure because right. we have a clear delineation in our house about when we have a weekend. We start our weekend on a Friday night. I definitely uh, don't work Saturdays at all. And on Sundays I do my writing and my thinking, which I can do um, just sitting around. But that means that Monday to Friday, he has a routine, which is about, you know, getting me cups of tea, he gets me breakfast, he gets me lunch, he gets me dinner. So I don't have to do anything domestic. Um, and he has a structure, I have a structure. And I think that's what saved us. And what you and I were talking about um, before was that what I did alongside the programs that I'm overseeing is I continued with my training. Um, I, I believe in investing in the future of my profession. I love my job. Um, and I think if somebody with my experience isn't prepared to try and transfer their, their knowledge, then who will? Um, so I, I moved my courses online. And what I found really rewarding um, is the, the, the fact that people coming on a, a couple of days of training, sometimes they've come on the, uh, the the change management practitioner, which is the full five days. Sometimes they're on the agile change agent, which is a couple of days. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, they've been with a team of people, a new group. Um, they've 
formed relationships they've got my energy they've 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 enjoyed the structure of learning the structure of the course having something to prepare for um, building up new relationships and as we were saying if you are looking for work you're out of contract and this yeah. is a time that's not easy to get a new contract no. it's very hard because you're lonely day after day where's the impetus i've i've been there i used to be a contractor years ago and i remember what it's like if you're not in contract and you start to lose a structure and you start to lose contact with people and this of course has accelerated it and what i'm delighted by is the fact that uh, people are well they're getting new qualifications so they've got something concrete to update their cv with i get them to write articles about their training because i'm saying on linkedin say something tell people what you've learned what you know wrap it into your experiences show people you're up and running and you're invested in your career and they're also making contact behind the scenes with other people who are also in the same boat, uh, who are supporting them. And, and I am delighted to say a very large number of the people who were out of contract have got new contracts as a result of their new energy, their new sort of organizational skills. And, and the fact that they, they've they used the sort of a, a training event as a, as a way of sort of almost maybe re, repositioning where they're up to. Yeah. And I, I am I am really, really delighted by that. Um, so I just feel I said to you, I joked it's like a social service and it it does. It means a lot to me that I um, I hear what's going on. And I've also done quite a lot, which is sad, but I've done quite a lot in my role as the um, lead on the Change Management Institute in the UK, um, but also in my role as a as a trainer, a lot of mental health work behind the scenes because I have had people uh, absolutely in tears. I've had people feeling a sense of hopelessness and real fear, um, and I've just taken time out. Um, I stumbled on one conversation with a, a guy. I'm not going to obviously tell you much, but um, let's say I, I was just in contact with him on what seemed like a, a very simple, straightforward thing. I was on the, the phone for a couple of hours because um, as we talked, it became apparent that he was really, really suffering from missing people. And his job involved meeting lots of different people every day, uh, traveling all around London and lots of different locations. And he was really suffering. Um, I'm glad to say he's much better now, but he is not the only one. There's been quite a few. Um, and um, I think therefore those of us who do have the benefit of uh, a job to do we've got structure you know we need to be thinking about those that perhaps need some support couldn't agree more with that melanie we're going to jump into some of the the subjects that we've been discussing um let's talk a little bit about you know a post covid 19 world and around you know organizations at the moment looking at automation they're looking at their their the target operating model what's that going to look like their cost based savings what can leaders do? What what are what are businesses looking should be doing and thinking about doing in 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 the next three to six months? I think I, I run a sort of um, informal chief executive support group. So I um, I do board advisory work anyway, uh, but I have found that I am uh, I do spend a lot of evenings in virtual gin and tonics um, with um, C suite executives uh, around the world talking about what's going on with them. So my comments are informed by by what we're talking about. Um, I think number one, um, there is a real realization that wherever they've got to on their virtual journey, it's not uh, been good enough, certainly not for this. Um, and therefore there's, whether you call it the digital transformation or not, but certainly having had to move all staff to online working, they're now thinking and, and their customers are online. So it's about how on earth do we rejig what it is we do. Um, mm -hmm. Even something as simple as a financial services organization having to rethink its know your customer rules because as part of financial services legislation you have to know that who you are dealing with and a lot of the time that has meant that we go and present our passports our driver's licenses and we go and meet face to face with people well if you can no longer do that how do you rework your know your customer process to allow that to happen mm -hmm. um how do you support how do you make sure that staff can get work done if actually we have there's one organization that they basically they they didn't see this they didn't see lockdown coming how they missed it i'm not sure but anyway they didn't see it coming and and basically um they just left their offices one day and didn't go back and so there were bundles of paperwork everywhere 
on the desks back in the office that staff couldn't access. And a huge number of staff hadn't taken laptops home, all sorts of things going on. It was chaos. Um, but they've now, you know, the first few weeks were a real mess, but they've made a huge change to how they do their work. Um, uh, the, I think I, I don't know any organization that hasn't implemented Microsoft Teams or Zoom or both uh, in the last few uh, few months. So I think there's some changes there and a realization in the boardroom. Uh, wow, we should have done this a long time ago. I think the second thing is a realization that if you're heading towards recession, now people as old as me have the benefits because we've been through several recessions before and I am holding conversations with people about what happened in 2000 and well 2008 2009 and to be honest in the UK particularly 2010 was when we really were bedding into that recession and the key thing you're looking at is your customers do not want to pay for luxury services what they want is they want streamlined they want efficient uh, they want uh, as far as an elapsed time is concerned they want short because if your process is a bit of a muddle then that means that it costs them more to engage with you. Their staff will have to pay more to, to sort you out. And, and from that perspective, that just doesn't make any sense. So I think that um, streamlining, um, automation has been a, a big issue. Um, uh, several C CIOs have said to me the same comment, which is effectively from a, from a change management perspective, Mel, we've managed to achieve probably in a couple of weeks um, about three, four years worth of change because moving all the, the automated tools that we wanted to use. And we were always told, oh, it's not right for this, or I'm not sure that that yeah. would do, that will dehumanize the customer experience, et cetera, et cetera. Well, those, those, those went out the window pretty quickly. Um, and I think from a CIO perspective and a business transformation perspective, there is a real desire to build on those changes, not roll back from them. Yeah. Um, and I think from a change management perspective, um, ironically, the longer uh, any version of lockdown goes on works in our favor because um, it beds down this as the new norm. So all sorts of new tools that are automating, streamlining what we do um, is actually sort of starting to become with week after week of practice, something that people would then accept as the new norm. Maybe they won't move back to later on. So I, I think there's some, yeah, there's some very interesting things happening. But when it comes to what initiatives and therefore how people should be thinking about what work's going to be available, um, uh, another organization I think encapsulated what quite a few are saying, um, which is that at the end of the day, there is their automation piece that they are going to keep going. And when it comes to making an argument for um, to the finance director about what we should continue to invest in, um, you can actually see across a lot of organizations a very clear pattern of, well, OK, what we're going to be doing is this is the thing that we will be investing in. So you're telling me that we're going to take steps out of a process. You're going to tell me that we're going to rationalize our systems. Then we're going to do it now target operating models was if you like I, I think I look back over all all my conversations and all my work and and sort of um, creating a new target operating model has been the trendiest change of the last two years um, and that um, has accelerated again um, also coming back I know all of the major consultancies do the work on spans and layers in other words delayering your organization uh, streamlining it um, and so, and, and I'm doing some work on that with an organization at the moment, which just brings you back to the criteria, which is our pro, if, you, if you're going to delayer and therefore you're going to make somebody sort of oversee a much wider group of people, a larger group, because we haven't got all of these sort of governance layers, mm -hmm. then you're going to have to streamline. You're going to mm -hmm. have to have an intuitive process. You can't have loops around the process. If you're trying to sort of try to oversee a lot more people, you're going to have to have commonality in the steps that they take. You're going to have to be very clear when something is an exceptional situation. And going back to the recessionary conversation, if you cannot service your customers in the most efficient way, then the costs go up for them and they'll turn to somebody who can service them in an efficient way. So efficiency, again, keeps coming back to the fact that it's not just the finance director. I think it's going to be something around customer driven. At the end of the day, what we can charge our customers 
um, is not going to be as, as much as we would like. So margin is going to come under pressure. So if you haven't got a streamlined process and, you know, the, the, also the to coexist alongside that, if you do have added value services, exceptional situations, you need to be clear about what they are, what their value is and charge for them, not just forget to charge for them because you mm -hmm. wrap it into to things. So I think there's, I think this has actually been a giant wake up call um, for things that were happening anyway. So I don't think we've, I don't think we've stepped that much off a cliff. I don't think we're in a completely different world, but I do think that the things that we've seen in the last few years around streamlining and automation um, are still with us, but perhaps there's more of an understanding of what that means I think a lot of executives have had a very interesting experience themselves um, because they are having to, to engage with technology they don't usual, usually do. Yeah. Um, so, I, yeah, I think we're in an interesting place, but I, I, don't, think, I don't think it's a strange place. I think mm. it's an accelerated place, but I don't think it's strange. Well, we, did, we, we, we touched on it before we went live, and I know I don't want to get talked in politics, but the bit I, I, I did want to touch on there just very quickly is, you know, we talked about being positive and get, getting business moving and, and getting Britain moving and or, or other countries. Obviously, there's people who are listening to this in other countries. But what, what positive signs can we be saying to within within organizations and businesses to try and help get businesses moving into a into a new way of working? I mean, what's your view on that? Um, I did economics as my first degree. So I'm going to keep things um, really simple, um, which is I think that if we all know that GDP is going to fall off a cliff. And in fact, the, the figures from the United Kingdom this morning, I don't think they are very high, um, um, but I don't think they're a great surprise to many of us. Um, but I have started to recharacterize what we're doing as um, the lost year. Um, in that everything that I'd sort of planned to do personally, I've sort of, you know, uh, this time next year, I'll start again. You know, if I go back to the beginning of March and now 2021, I'll start my year again. So my view is from a positive point of view, um, whatever I achieve um, this year is a bonus because, frankly, you know, it's the lost year. Um, I think from a GDP perspective, yeah, massive hit because actually the economy has, has stopped. But when it restarts, we haven't changed. It's a very unusual recession. It's not a recession that is made up of a, uh, a, a longer term slowdown. It was, we stopped, we closed for business. And there are no factors that indicate that when we reopen for business, that the, 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 the wider economic drivers have changed so much that we wouldn't want to go back to doing things like we want to travel. So from an airline perspective, they are talking about three year hits. Um, it's going to take them three years to get back to the numbers that they had at the beginning of this year. But there's no earthly reason why they won't make those numbers and get back. There'll be pent up demand. It's the same as whether you, uh, you were going to buy a new car or whether you still need to move house because you want to get near a good school for your kids. Yeah. All of those things are there's pent up demand, which is not the usual in other recessions. And so I think for me, when I say it's the lost year, I sort of think, well, okay, we're going to have a, a really bad year. But, you know, the, the future is as soon as the doors open for business, we get back to business. I mean, if you look at some of the retailers that have succeeded, um, the, the shopping is huge. I mean, some of the retailers have been very clever. They've recognised that calls like this mean that we perhaps want, uh, we want uh, uh, tops, polo shirts, maybe jackets, but we don't want you know, uh, more formal clothing, particularly. And those that were very, very quick to put all of those sort of needs up online uh, have seen a, a massive um, a amount of ordering going on. So the demand is still there. Um, yeah. and I, I, so I'm, I'm hope I'm, I'm actually quite hopeful. I, I, I sort of, I, I began to think um, a little while ago that when you get scientists who sort of talk about, uh, and this was prevalent about four to six weeks ago, that we would have to remain in lockdown until there was a vaccine and all these sorts of things, um, that I began to think that like the Second World War, that you could be imprisoned for um, actually saying very negative things because it had an impact. It was treasonous because it had an impact on the will of the entire country. Um, and I did begin to think that maybe we should go back to something like that, because if you haven't got anything good to say, then keep your mouth shut. 
because negativity breeds negativity oh, and yeah. there's a lot of people who have really struggled so it is our job those of us who are doing okay it's our job to put out a positive message because and i really believe it it's not uh, rubbish I, I i think yeah <clears throat> the economic indicators pent up demand you know it we have lost a lot we won't but if you look at it in terms of making it back up no but if you talk about as soon as the doors open will we start to see business come back yes we will I, do you know what? I, 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 I totally agree on that. And just to touch on a point there, and again, you know, if, if you hear things from government who are a bit, you know, worse, worse recession for years, and then you look at the the market, you know, I'm, I'm a member of travel groups, and they are itching to fly again. You've also think about, you know, well, why would I have a Zoom conversation to be engaging with a customer? I can just do it on Zoom. Well, it's those sideline conversations. It's that coffee afterwards. It's that beer at the pub or whatever it is. It's those conversations that are going to move the needle forward for your for those businesses. And I absolutely agree with you there. I think we're going to see it, optimism is the key and people are itching to get going again. So it's a great point there. Um, Melanie, let's just talk about virtual leadership. And I just to give some practical tips around this. So how people can work, you know, in this environment now, how is virtual leadership changing? How can people adapt well? What practical tips can people to do to, to manage teams who, who they're not seeing face-to-face, -face, not having those relationships, they're not having those side conversations that we just said, building trust, they're having to do it over Zoom or Teams. What can people do in their organizations right now? I'm certainly seeing winners and losers. I was only thinking about this this morning because I'm overseeing a number of teams. And what I talk about with the losers is those that basically go silent. Um, they might be very busy um, at work in, in their own little bubble, um, but I don't know that uh, because they're not responding to emails, they're not arranging meetings, I'm sending out stuff, they're not replying. Um, and at the end of the day, um, when it comes to virtual leadership, I think one of the things, um, and I'll send you all the links to some of the things I've been pulling together for people, but um, I think it's about being present, um, being trusted, um, and that requires quite a level of organisation. I think one of the first things um, is that, um, and this is why I say if you go silent, it causes a huge problem, uh, mm. because at the end of the day, if you're, you're going silent, people will put an interpretation on that, that either you are overwhelmed uh, or you're disorganized or you're not working, but none of that is a, is a positive spin. If I get an email, I'm obviously in the middle of a conversation with you right now, and that's an hour out of my day. Um, but as soon as I finish this, I'll just go through my emails because there will be numerous emails. We all know that the traffic has gone through the roof. Mm -hmm. And I'll have a look and I'll see if thing, people want things. If I can answer them there and then, I will get rid of them. But if there are things that are gonna require more work, I will go back to that person and say, right, I've seen your request. I've put it in my diary. I will get it done by tonight or I will get it done first thing Monday morning and come back to you. And what I'm doing is being organized enough to keep the flow of conversation going. Now, if I'm honest, that would be probably the same conversation if somebody saw me in the corridor and said, mm. can you get that to me? Or um, I really need to see your thoughts on this. If they, if they saw me in the corridor, they saw me in the canteen, that's the sort of thing they'd say to me. And I would obviously reply. I wouldn't walk past them in the corridor and just ignore them. So why do I do it via my emails? It's madness. Um, so at the end of the day, there is something about keeping that communication going. I personally have found that with that aspect of my virtual leadership, being more present has required more effort, definitely. Um, and I have two checks, really. At the end of the day, I try to go through everything and make sure that I haven't missed anything. And then often the five, 10 minutes before I go to sleep, I'm, I'm still sort of just the, what happened during the day. And inevitably something will pop up and I just send myself a quick reminder on the phone and then I'll deal with it in the morning. Because I am very conscious that if something gets dropped, the silence from the other side, because I'm experiencing it and I am making some very negative judgments about people who cannot get their act together. Because I'm thinking, well, if seriously, if you cannot reply to this email at some point in the week, 
then how why would I want to use you for anything because you just don't seem to be able to keep a grip of things um it looks like you're drowning now uh should we have a conversation about whether this is more of a mental health issue or is it just the fact that you know you can't be bothered I'm not sure but we need to talk because at the moment the opinion is you know other people respond timely responses shows engagement it shows commitment it shows interest and i think there is something around how we all behave it's there is it's not virtual leadership in terms of um i'm a senior leader virtual leadership it's virtual leadership personal responsibility virtual leadership and mm. how, how do we put ourselves across um i think something else that um is incredibly important in that leadership as well is um, being more organized, um, I have to do more work ahead of time than mm -hmm. I ever realized. Because if I'm hosting a meeting, um, I'm absolutely clear now, probably more than I was before, what's the purpose of the meeting? Who needs to be there? Because if I try to get an hour in your diary on Microsoft Teams, well, there's only eight, nine working hours in the day. And an awful lot of people are booking one hour slots. So it's kind of reducing the amount of bandwidth you have. Um, and I want to be clear that if I invite you to something, what's the purpose? Why do I need you, David? Why, why am I interrupting you? Because that's what I am. I'm disrupting your flow. Mm -hmm. So why do I need you? What is it that I need you to do in this meeting? What is it that I need from you? What do you need from me to be able to take part effectively? So I'm creating um, more, certainly more structured agendas. And I'm also Moscowing the hell out of those agendas. To be absolutely clear, put the, the must-have items first because mm. time can just evaporate. And I'm very clear, if I can get to the shoulds and the coulds, I'd be very happy. But if nothing else, maybe we just need to do the must-haves as people contribute in the meeting, you sort of realize that some of these other things aren't quite as important ditch them. Don't just go, well, I'll keep going until the hour is up. I'm trying to get my teams to celebrate. We finished that in 20 minutes. Right. Everybody hang up and go and do something else with your time. You don't need right. to wait till the full hour. Yeah. But it does require, I am having to think ahead more and I'm having to be more careful. What is it that we're discussing? What do we need as a result of the discussion? Because I think in the first few weeks, there was an awful lot of chat, 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 but not coming out with the outcomes. So now I'm sort of saying, as a result, what, what is it that we need to do as a result of this? And I think the, the second thing, McKinsey have written pretty well on this actually, is the, is the, um, the, the psychological impact of this. Um, I wouldn't normally have, <laughs> I don't stand in a room normally with a mirror up to my face looking at myself. And yet how many times are we, I'm trying to look at you, I'm not looking in the camera, guys, but I'm actually looking at the screen where David is to try to, for me, that feels like a normal conversation. But there yeah. I am right on the right hand side. And occasionally I look at myself and think, oh, heavens, you know, and it's and, and it requires that level of concentration. And I'm watching David's body language. And I'm also and distracted by the fact that there's a whole load of um, comments that are coming in from people. So it's great that you're having a I'm, I, by the way, I am reading them all at the same time that I'm talking. But it is that level of energy. Um, yeah. I'm uh, people who know me always sort of say, I don't know how you get everything done. Um, uh, I absolutely love what I do and I put lots of energy into it. Um, and I try to compartmentalize stuff. Um, I, I know the neuroscience is that the brain doesn't really multitask. Uh, multitasking is actually with the brain switches between tasks very, very quickly. So multitasking, you're not simultaneously doing things, you're switching very, very fast, which is incredibly stupid as far as the brain energy is concerned. So I tend to compartmentalize, focus on something, even if it's just 10 minutes of complete focus, then move to the next thing. Mm. So that's how I get through an awful lot of stuff. And, and, and I, I love what I do. But even I, somebody who's well known for being very productive, I spent the first few weeks beating myself up. And I kept saying to my friends, have I got lazier? Am I more stupid? I said, I'm getting to the end of like a 10 hour day when I might have done 12 or 14. I haven't had to do the commute. I haven't flown anywhere. And yet I'm shattered. And mm. I, I've got nothing left in my head. I mean, I have watched wallpaper television for an hour at the end of the day and then sort of crawled off to bed, absolutely shattered before it all starts again. And I found the first few weeks so hard. And I think it is that concentration bit 
Um, so there's something about personal, there's personal responsibility, but I think there's also, I know the phrase self-care is doing the rounds now, but there is something around uh, that sort of personal leadership, lead your own time, lead your own stuff that I think, yeah. um, and I, I think that's really helpful. Um, I can see Jane, who's just put a comment on there, is also reminding us that um, there's a humanity, it, 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 that time is needed for humanity on these calls. Mm -hmm. and that we need to turn our cameras on. Uh, we need to, I've yeah. had a great group that I've never met. I'm working with a group over a four week period and uh, we're chatting and um, uh, I'm seeing a lot of dogs. Uh, I'm seeing some cats, although they don't come online quite so they don't walk in front of the camera much. Uh, we've had babies, we've had children. There was a five year old the other day. She had a lovely lollipop and she sat on her mum's knee while her mum did quite a lot of incisive analytical work in front of all of us and she sort of like dozed in her mum's arms I've had a four month old who went off to sleep just by the sound of my voice I don't know what that tells me about my own productivity um but uh you know there is something about getting to know each other's houses you know and and the fact I don't put a background on this is uh one of the you know um uh, one of the rooms in, in the house I've rented here in Malaga. Um, and, you know, it's probably not my decoration taste, but never mind. Um, but, you know, I don't mind people seeing me. I'm often in the garden, so they see the trees. Um, uh, they hear 42 kilos of Labrador having his say, um, mm. particularly if an Amazon driver arrives. Um, and it's just, you know, there's something about maybe put a bit of effort into being human as well. It doesn't, you know, let's include that. I think I agree with that comment. I, I I said to my wife the other day, it feels a bit like Groundhog Day every day at the moment, you know, literally grounding it out. And, you know, I've, with, with two young children here and I don't know, you know, more respect for, for mothers, more respect for teachers. I don't even have to look after the kids all day and I'm knackered just hearing them and de dealing with the whatever. So we need to get back to schools. We need to get Britain moving again. Um, what, tell me, tell me, Melanie, what do you think? Um, we, we just touched on it a little bit there, but moving this conversation online, we talked a bit about that. Yeah, how can people keep moving that conversation online, develop those those that 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 online environment, keep engaged with their their teammates, their peers, um, but also as we come out of this, how can we think about well, what 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 a new opportunity is going to look like, and how can they engage with the workforce that they might be joining? Yeah, I do think that. Um... As far as onboarding, if you're going to be joining um, a new role, um, I think there is um, uh, plenty of, of things you can do um, to actually engage with colleagues. I mean, I started work with a new organization is it two days ago, um, and I have never met any of them face to face. Um, so what I asked for very specifically was an opportunity to um, what I would normally do, meet with some of the key directors who I'm going to be working most closely with. Normally, we would have, um, I might have come into the office um, and uh, got to know them a little bit. We might have gone for a coffee or for lunch. Um, none of that's possible anymore. So what I've done is I've arranged some um, virtual gin and tonic sessions after work. Um, and I thought one of the really important things about that was that it is outside of that meeting after meeting after meeting it's still still an online meeting we were using mm -hmm. microsoft teams but you know we were sat there we both arranged to get we had a drink i had some uh, we had a, a bowl of crisps and a, a drink and so did he um and it was just um we put an hour in the diary but we were just sat there chatting we didn't take the full hour and it was just getting to know each other chatting about what I've been doing, what he's been doing, and just, you've got to be fully present, I think. You've got to be really interested and invested in the conversation, but putting those in place. Now, whether or not that's because you're joining a new firm, mm -hmm. or if you're working with a recruitment agent, um, it's about building that relationship so they get to know you, so they can pass on real stuff about your personality to those hiring managers. Um, and also when you are involved in the interviews, again, it's about don't f be afraid to be who you are, to be human. Um, and, and to, you know, it's, it's rather than sort of being completely formal. Um, so, but I do think there is quite a lot to be done um, in, in terms of relationship building. There's one thing that's come up. Um, we were talking on a members webinar at the Change Management Institute the other day. Mm -hmm. um, 
which is around networking. And I think this applies to sales jobs. I think it applies to applying for new work uh, and getting new programs set up, which is um, how do I find new connections? Um, what what is has left us, and I, I cannot see it coming back in the near future, is things like um, expos and conferences, um, all sorts of uh, breakfast briefings. I mean, when I'm in London, I would normally go to at least two meetups every week. Now, yeah. obviously, leading the Change Management Institute often that might be put on by the, the Change Management Institute, uh, but also I'd go to lots of agile meetups right across London, um, and there might be breakfast and all sorts of things. And I would meet new and interesting people, and I would expand my network that way. Mm -hmm. And none of that's possible. So I stepped back and thought, well, how do I continue to refresh the people that I know? Um, and what I found is that I've joined different LinkedIn groups. I've posed different questions. I've been sort of starting to make connections with people I, I don't normally talk to. Mm -hmm. um, and at the Change Management Institute, we've been talking about how perhaps we put on some discussion sessions where actually, although we're sort of posing a question, we're putting you into sort of lots of little breakout rooms so that you can meet two or three other people and form a relationship you know, over the sort of half an hour chatting and, and just, you know, we're actually thinking at the Change Management Institute of how we can facilitate that opportunity to meet others that you would normally have had a warm glass of wine with at one of our face-to-face -face events. How can you do the equivalent on one of our online events? And it's not about learning something specific. It's about, you know, how do we get to know all these different people? How do you expand your network? And it's the same if you're in sales. How do you find new potential customers if you can't go and visit them? You know, but I'm, I'm working with somebody here in, in Malaga. He, um, he, he's building up his business. And uh, basically, um, he is picking himself up from the fact that business went through the floor. Um, so he's gone back over all of his, his existing customers, still trying to keep in contact with them. But he's expanded out his search way past the standard geography. He used to work um, in the southwest of England only. So now he's expanded out to the whole of the UK for the services he offers. And he's gone and looked at all of the companies that were similar to those he was working with in the southwest. And he said, I built up a database of 350 different organizations I'm now starting to talk to. Mm. Um, and, and it's a very deliberate act about building up his customer base. Um, and and I think that he illustrates two things. One, that you continue to go and look for the people you want to have a meaningful conversation with and then start that conversation. Um, and the second thing is that he's no longer bound by geographic limits uh, because if he's not in Plymouth, he doesn't have to just work around the Plymouth area. Um, and therefore, and it, it's been a real seismic shift for him going, oh, He's, he was trapped down here in Malaga as well. So, um, uh, But it was a case of, oh, I don't need to be bound by the geography. So I, I think there's a lot we can do. Absolutely. I love, I, love, I love the point about the gin and tonic, and I've heard that a few times in whatever that form that comes, juice or coffee for the, the non-drinkers out there. But just to make that practical point, if I was joining an organisation, I would be reaching out to those key stakeholders to organise that gin and tonic. It doesn't have to come from the leadership. It could come from you in that team to go and search them out and be brave and put that in their diary, send them a calendar because they're probably fed up with having, well, not fed up, but they're, you know, they don't have those kind of opportunities every day in their diary or every week where they could just, de 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 you know, come away from the, 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 the business work and talk about what's happening in those people's lives and how, how things can be improved is, you know, do you see that working well? It's working really, really well. And I'm not just doing it in the evenings. Um, I obviously work in the Middle East. Um, so sometimes I'm having a coffee with a plate of dates um, rather than a gin and tonic. Um, and I've also said to some people, um, I've got one person that um, I'm working with. Um, and probably at least once a week, I sort of say, do you fancy a cup of tea? 
Um, mm. And, you know, uh, we would normally sit down for a cup of tea and a biscuit um, if we were probably in the office. So that's what we're doing. Um, and some people I might have had breakfast meetings with. I mean, it's different. So I've sort of said, you know, do you fancy having um, do you fancy having a breakfast meeting? Um, and one of the giggles has been, you know, what have we chosen to bring? And literally, we're bringing the food to the table. So you can see that I've got a boiled egg or and soldiers or, you know, you can see I've got, you know, marmalade from the oranges in my friend's garden. But whatever it is, you know, it's just there's a little bit of a talking point. And we are sort of saying we were going to eat breakfast anyway. Can I eat breakfast with you today rather than eating breakfast with my family? So mm -hmm. I think there are lots of things you can do if you're just a bit creative. And frankly, uh, it's outside of those sort of those real business hours. I'm still having I have lunch with people. Uh, it's a half an hour, but I will have lunch with people at the Change Management Institute. We're having a uh, our volunteers day is normally a solid half a day in a conference room where we have lots of breakout meetings. We have lots of we pl we make our plans for the next six months. We allocate tasks to each other. And we're going to do it on the 3rd of July, but it's going to be a picnic. We're doing a virtual picnic. Everybody brings their favorite picnic drink, their favorite picnic food. And, you know, to be honest, a good hour of that agenda is going to be going around talking about that with each other and forming those relationships. I've had to step back and think about how we do that. Um, mm -hmm. So it's taken a bit of effort, but and it will take effort to um, actually pull together my own picnic. Normally, what we would have done on those meetings is just go to prep and get a whole load of sandwiches sent in that we then would have moaned about. So this time I'm going to make a real effort. And I'm sure some people are going to do really brilliantly and amaze me uh, with the way they set things out. I'm probably just going to have a sandwich in a Tupperware box, but other people will be far more impressive. But it's just it's about people's personality and the connections. We shouldn't ever forget the neuroscience, which is around, if I feel that I've got a connection with you, you're part of my tribe, that you and I share similar views on things, we've had similar experiences in the past, then my brain, when I'm listening to you, is using exactly the same part of the brain that mm -hmm. it uses when it listens to my own voice. Mm -hmm. And when it, when my brain is listening to me, it's not judgmental, it's not defensive, it's not critical. So I open up to you and I am then I become a far better correspondent. I'm interested in what you have to say. I am I park my judgment. I'm I'm a better friend. As mm -hmm. soon as I start to see those connections, it's just how the brain works. So we would be really stupid to try to to, to edit that out of what we do we've got to put it back in. And I think a lot of people are starting to realize that. And it is, it's all of those things, including, hey, this is my household. I have called my father, who's nearly 86, into a variety of different meetings to, to say, hey, this is the guy, look at this, my dad's just coming across to give me a cup of tea. You know, because it's, mm. it's, I want you to know my family situation. Look, here's 42 kilos of Labrador you know, um, and he's got his big toy in his mouth. Um, I want you to see my family because I want you to know me a little bit. Uh, because if that's the case, then I know that you and I will work together far better. Brilliant. Now, we're going to we're going to pick up some of the questions and some of the comments in just a few minutes. And if you've got a question that you'd like to put to Melanie, put it in the comments section now. But um, what Can I, I just read one out? Yeah. Can I Go read on one then. out? Go on. Which, one, which, one, which one do you want to read Phil out? Phil Fisher um, has said, Phil Fisher has said, we've introduced a coffee bot which automatically pairs random employees up for a coffee break. Um, really good as we've been chatting to people we wouldn't normally get to chat with. I think that's absolutely fantastic. Um, I've also known of other organisations that have taken the time to pair up people who are living alone um, and therefore, um, and haven't had any support, they've actually paired up people in different parts of the country um, to actually have a sort of a, a buddy system, if you like. So I think the coffee bot and the buddy system are two really very important ideas. I think that's great. And thanks, Phil, for that one. And I'll come back to a couple of other points you made as well, which was brilliant. I, I, just talking to the market, I think there's also a lot of people out there that are that were you know going to change organization going to change company and all those plans have been put on hold i mean masses of people what what do you think before we just take a few questions and a few more comments what do you think people can do to help them excel in the new norm so they're ready for taking advantage of that environment 
Um, I think at the end of the day, achievement is everything. Um, mm. Yeah. I was uh, commenting on somebody's um, LinkedIn profile only yesterday uh, when he asked me for some advice. And I sort of said, you've used a whole load of keywords here, uh, portfolio management, benefits realisation. But you haven't told me anything about anything you've done in those areas. And um, I'm not interested in your job title. I'm interested in what, if I hired you, what would you do for me? What are you experienced in? What successes have you had? And um, what outcomes have you achieved? Who for? What was the impact of those outcomes? So just talk, to put in your profile achievements. Mm. And so I, I, I was actually talking to somebody the other day who was going to be moving firms and isn't. And I said, right, okay, you've made a sort of patch with yourself that you're gonna take that off the table for six months, fine. But in those six months, right, make sure you keep an achievements diary, make mm -hmm. sure that you get your qualifications up to date make sure that you take part in other conversations with with different linkedin groups for example post yep. articles share things make sure that you you actually are c creating that profile so all of those things they've never been more important so it's all about achievement um and i i think just do things like get your qualifications up to date um, my biggest issue with some people is that you look through and um, they tell me they're in change management and all they've got is project management qualifications or mm -hmm. they tell me that they're in project or change management um, but what I see is a Prince 2 qualification and nothing about Agile and that kind of ages them by about 20 years and you think right okay just take, get somebody to have an objective look somebody like you David you know just have an objective look and say do you know what your CV looks a bit dated it looks a bit you know it doesn't look like you've done much in the last five years if ever there was a chance to to really sort of put some effort into it now is the time definitely let's touch on that comment from from jane real quickly thank you jane for that um i know she just touched on that turning cameras on more than ever before which is great what what you know is that is that how can we help people to, to, to have that more confidence to do it? How, how does it help them to perhaps be, not the word noticed, but how does it help them with their, with their, own, uh, uh, their own personal brand within that organization? What, 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 what's the benefit for them? Or what are you seeing that people can do? Well, I've I, what I've done, I've done a couple of things. Um, where I had somebody the other day who was sort of, he hadn't put a po photograph on LinkedIn. And I showed him, I just did a, a quick thing where I showed him a screenshot of somebody with a photograph and somebody without. And I said, seriously, which one do you warm to most? <laughs> and it was fairly obvious, you know, so yeah. this is not difficult stuff. Another thing that I've been doing, really practical stuff, is that sometimes I pick up my laptop and I show who are people who are hesitant about sharing their screen. Um, I picked up my laptop and just showed them the complete chaos and mess that maybe is either side of my desk and just said, for God's sake, if I'm prepared to show you what a mess I'm in and I'm still getting stuff done, what are you worried about? Mm. Or I'll, I'll point to a family member who's walking past and said, you know, it's it's, it's humanised me, hasn't it? You know, um, yeah. and yeah. do you think any less of me? You don't, do you? So why do you think other people would think less of you? Um, so I've tried to give sort of really practical examples from the, my own chaotic, messy life that makes people think, well, OK, maybe it's not the end of the world you know, it, you know it, it, that's that's what happens. I think I just want to bring up this comment by Mark here. Thanks, Mark, for this. Um, Mark said, yeah, the wording of email, et cetera, is crucial in leadership. Very easy to come across non-positive. These are great points because that's a really difficult thing. Again, how, what could they be doing? Could they be doing video instead? Or what, what, what's, what, can, what can organizations do? How, how can they help? Well, I think there's something about, we've always said, haven't we, um, criticise in private um, and praise in public. Um, and I think in this online world, if I have got a problem, I am not going to try to phrase that wording in an email because negative wording um, can, uh, you know, and, and certainly can make it worse if you're only hearing the words, if you're only reading my words. So if I've got a really challenging conversation, I'm gonna have it on the phone for a start. Second thing I'm gonna do is if I've got a, a difficult email to write, I'm gonna write it, I'm gonna print it out or put it up on the screen and have a, a read an hour later before I send it. And I'm gonna ask, I might even ask a family member, if you received this email, what would you think? What, how would you interpret it? As I, I do, I totally agree with Mark, and it's nice to see you again, Mark. I haven't seen you for a, for a while, so hello. Um, uh, 
that at the end of the day, you know, think through what the impact might be on somebody else. Um, Albert Morabian did work in the 1970s where he talked about the fact that only 7% of the communication we have as human beings is the words that we use. About a third of that communication is the tone of our voice, which you don't get from an email. And then the rest of it, another sort of almost two thirds is the body language, which you don't get from an email. So have mm. a think. And as you said, a nice little video clip goes a long way to showing uh, the tone of voice, the body language and the smile at the end of the day. I'll just bring up that one from Stuart. Thanks, Stuart, for joining in between between him and himself and Jane again. Um, talking about that clear agenda and that set of meetings from the outcome. I mean, I've been to so many meetings where actually no one has put, talked about that clear agenda. No one's talked about that set of meeting outcomes. Again, how maybe not everyone's quite quite um, confident enough to to put that message out from the start what can you what can you advise to them what do you see working well and Stuart thanks for that comment as well um, I think that I'm just being very upfront and sort of saying I and if it's not my meeting and it's mm -hmm. not being done it's always kind of difficult but I might say something like uh, hey guys um, I'm, I'm really sorry just just can I just take a moment to clarify what is it that we must make a decision on in this meeting? Because I, I've got so many meetings and they're all sort of starting to merge into one another. I'll make some kind of comment. It might be a self-deprecating comment, but the underlying is, why am I here? What is it that you need from me? Um, and, and just to, to clarify, and you're right, there's an awful lot of meetings where people aren't doing that. So I'm going, no, 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 don't let it happen to you. Don't be a victim. You know, Don't just sit there thinking, why am I listening to this? Just mm -hmm. ask the question, what is it that we must achieve? What are the, the top three things that you'd like to get out of this meeting? It stuns me the number of times I ask, and I do this in coaching, and I'll say, you know, what is it that you would like to be different by the end of this coaching session? What is it that you want to be able to do that you can't do now? And people think, oh, that's a really good question. I'm thinking, oh, is it? Um, but, you know, just... Just ask, why am I here? What is it that you need from me? I, and you might say, because I just want to make sure I've got all the right background papers. You could do this on an email beforehand if you can spot that there seems to be, shall we say, one of those meandering meetings that might be in your diary. Because if you sit on that call and it meanders around and you don't get anywhere, you've lost that hour and you'll have to make it up somewhere else. So, you know, just ask. Melanie, we're, we're nearly at the 55 minute mark. So I'm going to stop now so everyone can enjoy that five minutes in case they've got another meeting at uh, one o'clock or two o'clock or whatever time their time zone is. Melanie, thank you so much for giving me your time, giving the audience our time today. Uh, there were so many nuggets in there. If people want to connect in with Melanie, if you're not connected with her already, drop her a connection on LinkedIn. Write a note. I'll tell this as an advice to anyone. Put a note. Make the effort to write a note of why you're connecting. Don't just send a connection request. It's lazy. It's unprofessional. Make the effort to put a thing in. It only takes a couple of seconds. Connect with Melanie. Melanie, anything else you'd like to say before we go? We'd love to see um, you again soon. If you connect with me, you'll obviously get access to the resources, but I will send you, David, the links to a number of papers that I have written on this subject um, so that you can sort of uh, put those around to those that are interested. Brilliant. And thanks for everyone for joining us and also for reaching out and speaking to me on the phone in these last few months. I really appreciate it. And uh, have a great afternoon and a good weekend, everyone. Thank you very much. Take care. Thanks See you. Bye-bye. We really hope you enjoyed the podcast today. If you want to listen to more exclusive tips and life lessons from our guest, go to the resources page at vineresources.com.